not what you take when you leave the world behind you, but what you leave behind you when you go. Um, what do we leave behind us when we go? Um, today, the scripture I want us to look at is one that you know. It's from 1 John chapter 1. This is the message that we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our hearts. We pray with you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we thank you for your word that calls us to you, and we thank you for your word that calls us to each other. And we pray that you would uh, teach us today how to live in a way that matters. We give you the glory. Amen. I was really uh, torn by, uh, I, I wanted to do two different messages today, which is not unusual, you know, being ADHD. But um, <laughs> I kept thinking, what does it mean for us to walk in the light? Uh, I always thought, you know, growing up there in Sunday school, I mean, that meant that, that you're a good person and nobody can find fault with you, and so you're just, you know, you're kind of modeling uh, being a good person, um, which is probably part of it. The difficulty is that um, uh, how can we walk in the light if we don't know who we are? If we don't know uh, what makes us the unique person that we are? If... Uh, and, I, and I've spent a lot of my life um, hiding behind others, you know, by focusing on other people's issues and helping them with their problems, you know. Uh, I don't have to actually look at myself. So, driving up this week and seeing the sign for Harbor <coughs> Church uh, that says, For the Adventurous Spirit. And... Uh, and I thought, you know, I always like adventures because I get bored and so I uh, I want to go and do something different or, you know, have an experience that's different so it'd be adventurous. But then I thought, what, what happens if we turn that around and we actually go on a journey uh, to the center of us? Um, when I was a kid, I was, I was kind of obsessed with uh, fantasy stories, and so the journey to the center of the earth by Jules Verne, you know, they were in Austria, I think, and they left that old inn, and they went out to the back, and there were some stones or something, and they went and moved the stones aside and went down the stairs, or this uh, ladder, and pretty soon they ended up in the center of the earth and, uh, and had this huge experience. And, stuff. and then I thought about it, and I went, well, since I'm not able to go to Austria and find stones outside of an inn and move them and go there, what happened if we took that journey to the center, but we do it to us? What do we have down in our core that makes us the, the unique people that we are and, and that really is going to determine what we leave behind us when we go? So that's what I wanted to, to explore today a little bit. And uh, um, Merle Haggard died uh, this week. And uh, sort of America's poet, if you lived in Fresno or Bakersfield <laughs> or someplace like that. Uh, uh, the interesting thing was he, he was in the audience at Folsom Prison when Johnny Cash came and did that concert there. And he said that changed his life. Um, he was a convict there. Um, anyway, he writes this I sit alone at my table and watch all the others have fun. I'm tired of having no future living on things that I've done. And I'm tired of sitting on the sidetrack watching the main line run. 
tired. Maybe that's why we need an adventure. Maybe that's why we need a journey because uh, once we've done stuff and been somewhere and we, everything's worked out okay, pretty soon we go, is that all there is? Is there more? Is there something else? Am I missing something? Has everybody else uh, got it right except me and I'm kind of watching the world go by? Um, Boredom's a really insidious thing. And the only antidote for boredom, I think, is, is uh, to go on that journey to ourselves. Now, I want to uh, do a little artwork for you here. Sorry. Um, I was going to put this, uh, this chart I stole from the preschool up higher, but people told me it would not end well if I did that. So, um, it may not end well anyway. <laughs> Okay, so here's what happens in most of our lives, I think, or at least in mine, okay? I'll, I'll make this confessional. My life is kind of a circle, and, and honestly, boredom is a big part of it. Um, I was telling somebody this morning, uh, last time when I lived in Seattle, uh, back in the 80s, early 90s, I used to drink 30 cups of coffee a day. Starbucks. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, I'd eat those uh, chocolate-covered espresso beans. <laughs> you know, kind of perk you up a little bit. And uh, and she said, did you sleep? <laughs> oh, yeah, every three or four months, you know, no problem. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it kept me energized, and, uh, and I had this dread of being bored. I couldn't stand being bored. And so... Um, I'd almost create problems just so I'd have something to work on and, and to focus on uh, because I just couldn't stand this idea that, that my life is disconnected. See, those two things go together. We start out feeling a little bored in our lives and then we circle down and feel disconnected. Way down. There you go. See, disconnected. And uh, after we, this disconnection takes over, the spiral continues down. It looks like it's going up, but it's actually spiraling down. Okay, you have to get that 3D graphic that I don't do very well. The natural thing to do here is feel defensive. Defensive. Now, uh, you've heard about defenses, right? You have defenses, uh, defense mechanisms. If you're a psychologist, uh, those of you who are psychiatrists, you can help everyone uh, with their defensiveness. Um, I'm feeling defensive just as I'm talking about it. <laughs> but the defensiveness is not bad per se, because sometimes you need to protect yourself, right? It's it's self protection. But when you go from boredom to disconnection to self-protection to defensiveness, it only uh, takes you lower down into the cycle because out of the defensiveness then comes fear and the cycle continues. It's a kind of a death spiral. We're bored, we disconnect, we're defensive, <clears throat> we're afraid. And then we wonder why it is that we have to wait until the end of our life to bless anybody. Or, you know, uh, I can't wait till grandma dies so she can, uh, we, we can all sit around and talk about her, say what kind of person she was. What about, how, how do we live in such a way that we, what we leave behind us is not this? So, I'm going to get really uh, surprisingly aggressive here. Turn this around. It says pre-K, but you, you can listen too. <laughs> There's another spiral that I want us to, to explore. And this is the one that's the journey in, into the center of you. And it is the exact polar opposite of, of the other one. Because, let's start down here in the center. 
Okay? So, when we discover that actually we are the men and women that God loves, not just theoretically, but we actually discover that we're loved at the core, that we're lovable. In fact, uh, First John, we, we started with walking in the light, but if you turn the page, what's it say? Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everybody who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God, because God is love. At the core, at the, at the very center of who we are, we discover that we're loved. When that happens, when we realize that, it, it sets us on a journey that's a, a little bit of a different spiral. Because when we're loved, we're free to become involved, right? Now, if I was Merle Haggard sitting on the sidelines watching everybody else and feeling sorry for myself, I wouldn't be involved. I'd be sitting on the sidelines watching everybody else, right? Like he says. But when we, when we realize that God loves us, that we're the actual object of his love, that that's his attitude towards us, that's his behavior towards us, uh, that's his gift to us, then we're free to become involved in whole new ways. Uh, we can take risks. We can go to people we wouldn't normally go to. We could uh, go to places we'd normally not go. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be uh, any of those things. And, uh, and, and when we're involved, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get down here again. It's important to see a pastor on his knees sometimes. <laughs> we start to do good. We start to do good. We start to find ways to bless people, to solve problems, to fix situations, to come alongside and encourage. That's, that's doing good, right? To help out, to, to make a difference. And so we're loved, we're involved. See, if you're not involved, you can't say, oh, I'm loving, I, I just generally love people. But if you're not involved with them, I wonder if you really love them, but, but you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do good to anybody because you just kind of have a good heart, you know? No, no involvement. But if you're involved with people, what changes? Everything. Because now you want to be part of their life, part of their world, make their life better, make their, uh, help them to discover their love, right? And so we did good. And then, We start <clears throat> showing mercy, demonstrating mercy. This is probably the most uh, needed uh, gift that we could possibly give to anybody. Because all of us have voices in our head, some from real real voices and some we just make up, but, but we have, uh, we've heard things through our life uh, criticisms, uh, judgments, uh, evaluations, and we carry those with us. And we believe them, right? We totally believe them. We hang on to them. And we need somebody to come alongside and show some mercy and say, you know, maybe those people were wrong about you. Maybe they didn't know you. Maybe what they said about you is not really the way it is. And that's what showing mercy is. It's, it's, a, it's a loving kindness that says, you don't have to listen to that crap. You can say crap on the week that Merle Haggard died. <laughs> <laughs> or any week. Then something strange happens. We discover our love, we get involved, we start to do good, we, we're showing mercy, and then we discover... Intimacy. 
Intimacy is not something that you can pursue. It's something that you discover as you take the journey to the center of you. And you allow the implications of knowing and realizing uh, in your deepest being that you are loved and you're lovable as the base. Then intimacy. It's just right there. Now, it's impossible to be living intimately and be bored. The two are mutually exclusive. Boredom comes from separation, from fear, from uh, pushing away or being pushed away, whatever it is. And, and, and we find ourselves on the sidelines of our life. Intimacy, by definition, is you're in the center. You're in the center of life where uh, there's courage and freedom and grace and faith and joy and all of these things because you're living intimately with the Lord, people around you. And I think that's the key to walking in the light. That's walking in the light. Uh, I always wanted to walk in the light in terms of shining the light on other people and what they need to do differently. <laughs> Honestly, you know, I mean, that's basically what my strategy was. If I, if I, you know, you gave me a great flashlight, Will, and a very powerful one, and I like to, you know, shine that on each of you and say, oh, look what you're doing. Let me point that out. I can help you be better. But guess what? That's all out. What happens when the light gets turned on us? What do we discover? So why is, I asked somebody yesterday, why is it that it's so difficult for us to take this journey to the center of you? Why is it so difficult to do that? You know what they told me? We're afraid of what we'll find. Is that true? We're afraid of what we'll find. Maybe we'll find things that we don't like about ourselves. And we don't want to know that's there. And I'd rather not, I'd rather not go intimately into my life because I may not like what I find. Or I may not like that I don't find anything. What if we get there? I took the journey. I did what John said. I am walking in the light. I got an started, And instead of love and intimacy, what did I find? Just powerless. Maybe a few cobwebs. That would be disappointing, wouldn't it? Better to not go on the journey, right? Better to stay superficial, better to stay shallow, better to stay focused on everybody else than to go in and not like what we find. You know the problem with that? No, that's a real question. Do you know the problem with that? You never become who you're supposed to be. You never even know who you're supposed to be. Yeah, that's right, Dave. You not only don't become it, you don't even know what's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But see, here's the, the, the thing. The Bible says we love because we practice being loving and we work really hard at it and we make sure that any unloving things get squeezed out of our mind and we are very disciplined in how we do this. Oh, no? Is that what the Bible says? No. What's it say? We love because we're supposed to and that's what needs to happen and, <laughs> and John's going to get all over us again next week if we don't do this and so, okay, I guess I'm going to have to be loving. No, that's not it. We love because God first loved us. He first loved us. <clears throat> yeah. So when you get to the core, you're going to find this. There's nothing else there. 
And that's, that matters. All of a sudden, it matters. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to not look, not get too close, because we're going to get there and, and, and we're going to find out what Jesus said is true. And, and what the Bible teaches is true. And actually, we are loved. And that changes everything. So what do we leave behind? Uh, you all know Psalm 23, uh, the shepherd psalm, right? The Lord's my shepherd, shall not want. He makes me lie down. Makes me lie down, be faster, lead me aside still waters, he restores my soul. You know, it talks about that God provides for us, he cares for us, he takes care of our needs. And then it goes on, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, and, and so we have the, and his protection. Uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me, you're on your staff, they comfort me. I go, wow, that's great. He provides for us, he protects us. Isn't that great? And then it keeps going. Uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Yeah, they gotta watch me eat. Yeah, you anoint my head with oil, my cover. So he, he, he provides for us, he protects us, and he promotes us in front of the people who hate us. We want to see us destroyed. And, and, he, and he makes them sit and watch us eat. Cool. Get that? I love that. But the most important part of this psalm, very good. Goodness and loving kindness, mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That's what you leave behind. <clears throat> what is going to be following? What, what follows you? What, what's left behind as you live your life? Goodness and loving kindness and mercy. And now, it, you know, it'd be great if I could just get to the point where I die, go to heaven, and you all get together, and then some will laugh and some will cry, but... um. Uh, no unexpressed opinions, probably, at that funeral. And, uh, but um, then you'll all go, oh, wasn't he loving and kind to us while he's in heaven? But that's not what this says. This says, mercy and goodness will follow me when? All the days of my life. All the days of my life. From now, it should be happening now. You should be leaving behind goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy now. It's not like when you wait and when you get to heaven, then all of a sudden everybody's going to realize, oh, yeah, he left behind goodness and mercy. I forgot about that. No, it's all the days of my life. And then I know I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But it happens now. And I got to say, you all have been amazing because my experience, you know, I, I'm the guy who came here dead and, and broken and all those things, and you've been part of that healing because you've shown me goodness and mercy. As, as we've grown together, we've come to church together, you've been, you've been that uh, to me. And there's a lot of stories here in this room of how uh, somebody's life has been uh, nurtured and built up because of you, leaving behind mercy and goodness. Um, uh, when, uh, years ago, when Damien was a uh, young teenager, uh, after uh, the, the, he was raped by the youth leader at University Press, and we moved to California, he was going through hell. And... Uh, all kinds of issues and stuff. And we'd find him late at night. I'd hear him talking. And I'd go, what's wrong with that boy? You know, he's talking. Sometimes he'd be laughing. And sometimes he'd be crying and talking. And, and I think his uh, freshman year in high school, every night, he called somebody. I'd go, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm talking to Annie Mame. Go away. <laughs> Annie Mame. And uh, I thought, well, what kind of person is that that would talk to a kid in the middle of the night, every night, help him through his stuff, his issues? 
Then a couple of years ago, I was getting ready to come out and preach, and Damien ran him out and said, well, you can't believe it, Dad, Annie Ming was here. She walked into church today. Annie Ming was here. And, and Jane. You know, leaving behind goodness and mercy. In a young boy's heart, right there. Now, was that a hard thing to do? I don't know. I don't think so, though. Because when we're taking that journey to the center of you, and we find that we're loved, then we want to be involved, and we want to do better, and we want to show mercy, and we want to discover intimacy. Not because it helps somebody, but because it helps us live. We become alive in that. Right? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. We don't have time to be bored. There's no place on our life for boredom right now. This is a time to discover <clears throat> at the very core you are loved. You are loved. You are the object of God's love and you are loved by the people he puts in your life and you can love them. You'll never be bored again. If you let him love you. That's a journey we need to take. I, think, I hope that this is the year that if you haven't gone on that journey, you go on it this year. Say, I want to walk in the light. I want to know what's in the inside. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to protect. I don't have to be defensive. I don't have to blame. I don't have to be afraid. Because I'm loved regardless. Pray, Lord Jesus, pray that you would show us your love. Show us your care. And give us the courage to, to leave behind goodness and mercy as we go. Make every day of our life a journey into the center. And Lord, help us to remind each other of who we are in you. Transform us by your grace. That's our, that's our need and that's our prayer. Amen.